I will start off with three numbers, 1, 4.4, and 44. If you took everything that human eyes saw in 2013, everything that the human race saw, that would equal approximately one zettabyte, or one billion terabytes. One recent estimate puts the total size of the digital universe comprising digital content from photographs, movies, and surveillance video feeds, data produced and sent by sensors and connected devices, internet content, email, SMS, audio streams, and phone call metadata at 4.4 zettabytes in 2013. This doubles every two months. The digital universe is expected to grow to 44 zettabytes in 2020. Never before has so much information about so many people, events, and objects been available at such speed to so many people. Big data is what happened when the cost of storing information became less than the cost of making the decision to throw it away, or less than the future unknown benefit of keeping that data. New tools, including sophisticated algorithms, distributed computing capacity, and techniques that allow the efficient processing of very large data sets, have fueled the ability to extract meaningful insights from big data. Big data holds much promise for improving the planning and the management of transport activity by radically increasing the amount of real or near real-time mobility-related data. Likewise, access to more detailed and actionable data regarding the status of vehicles and the environment in which they operate holds much promise for improving transport safety. Big data is a pipeline in extracting insight from new or newly available large, diverse, and high velocity data sets is not trivial. The pipeline spans from the collection of data, its preparation for storage and analysis, its integration with other sources, modeling, visualization, and analysis to its interpretation, archiving, or deletion. Data can be purposely sensed, for example, where data is collected from a customized sensor network for predefined use, or data can also be opportunistically sensed, for example, where data is collected for one purpose and used for another. Increasingly, data can be crowdsourced as well by citizen sensors reporting on their individual experience via content sharing platforms. In all cases, big data may be born digital or born analog. Born digital data is created by users or by a computing device specifically for use in a machine processing environment, whereas born analog data concerns data that arises from an imprint of a physical phenomenon upon a sensing device. All along the pipeline, data users and processors must account for issues relating to heterogeneity, volatility, scale, privacy, representativeness, and value. And crucially, for public policy purposes, authorities cannot operate under the expectation that big data has done away with the need for statistical rigor, since big data is not only prone to many of the same errors and biases in smaller data sets, it also creates new ones. The proliferation of sensors concerns our cars and other vehicles, of course. Embarked sensors feeding information into multiple electronic control units generate vast amounts of data. There are 129 vehicle-related data elements in Etsy's Common Data Dictionary for Intelligent Transport Systems. If shared amongst vehicles, infrastructure, and services, many of these could improve safety, but some could compromise privacy. Work is underway to look for strong and robust data encryption standards. There are sensors everywhere in machinery, in roads and bridges, but as far as concerns better managing traffic and improving long-term planning, the most transformative sensor platform by far is in our hands. In 2013, there were 6.6 .6 billion mobile subscriptions globally, a number that Ericsson estimates will grow to 9 billion five years from now. About two-thirds of these concern phones that can be roughly located and tracked, whereas one-third involves smartphones, phones with multiple and precise sensor chips embedded. These sensor platforms will provide the bulk of mobility-related data in the future. And as they do, they will raise considerable privacy concerns. And here's why. Consider an individual's movement through a city, movement that is not only along two coordinate planes, but also their movement in time, here along a vertical axis. Other people move through the city as well, each with their own space-time trajectories. Our daily behavior is highly repetitive, as are the space-time trajectories that we produce and that are recorded by our mobile devices or using our mobile devices. Because of this, 
data concerning individual trajectories serves as a powerful quasi-identifier. They allow individuals to be identified much as a fingerprint does. This information is extremely valuable. Some have called data the new oil of the digital economy. To push that analogy further, if data is the core resource for the 21st century, then location data is the new economy's gold. But this data is also extremely personal and very difficult to protect. It is difficult because location data is precise and getting more so every day. The proliferation of devices able to use global navigation satellite system signals has been fundamental to the growth in location data. New location techniques further enhance tracking precision. Exploiting Wi-Fi network location data is perhaps the most important of these. Increasingly, exploitation of video feeds or audio signals will allow even more ubiquitous and precise tracking capability. The exploitation of sensor data can also reveal how the smartphone owner is moving. This capability is nearly mature, reliable in some tests, and will likely become more so as new devices combine sensors with on-chip processors. And protecting this data by anonymization is difficult because it remains unique even at higher levels of aggregation or lower levels of granularity. Consider a city like Chicago. Like almost all cities, it is serviced by a network of cellular communication towers that enable seamless mobile use. These masts delineate mobile service cells that are used to handle phone calls without disconnecting. Because of this, they also can be used to locate phones within their perimeter at a scale of a few dozen to a few hundred meters. Let's take an individual that can be precisely located by their smartphone sensors as they move through the city. They are going about their business, but their smartphone is also going about its business, broadcasting data to Wi-Fi networks as it tries to connect to known networks, storing time-stamped geolocation data used in the navigation app, sending out precise location fixes as the user updates their profile on Facebook or, or tags a new restaurant in Foursquare. In the end, we have a very precise track of that person's movement here in red, as well as a more anonymous trace of the same movement as recorded by the phone's presence in different cells. There are hundreds of other phones that are also present in those cells at the same times, and so this may serve as a reasonable basis for anonymizing that data. But it isn't. Location data anonymized by clustering at the level of mobile telecom cells can be re-identified in 95% of the cases with only four external data points, using, for instance, Facebook or Foursquare check-ins, previously joined Wi-Fi networks, or data from credit card transactions. These re-identification efforts are not trivial, but they're not difficult, and underscore the difficulty in protecting personal location data. To be clear, data fusion allows the generation of new knowledge and spurs innovation, but the privacy risks are real and are not well addressed by authorities. The difficulty with which trajectory data can be adequately and persistently protected has led some to question whether it is worth the effort to do so. Data protection policies are lagging behind new modes of data collection and uses, and this is especially true for location data. Rules governing the collection and use of personal data, for example, data that cannot be de-identified, are outdated in two ways. Data is now collected in ways that were not anticipated by regulation, or citizens and authorities have not accounted for the new knowledge that emerges from data fusion. A split has emerged among those who would seek to retain prior notification and consent frameworks for data collection and those who would abandon these in order to focus on specifying allowable uses of that data only. Among the former are those who seek to modify and strengthen rules based on the principles outlined in the 1980 OECD Personal Data Protection Framework and Guidelines. Among the latter are many in the private sector and some national administrations who suggest these rules are to a large extent unworkable in their current form. A new focus on regulating use rather than notification and consent presupposes the presence of a well-funded and competent regulatory authority to oversee data uses and to resolve and possibly prosecute conflicts. Furthermore, such an agency should be equipped to address asymmetric and extended legal struggles with large and powerful multinational corporations. These may be overly optimistic expectations. But there is a third way, 
and that way is increasingly working its way into regulatory frameworks. That third way is ensuring privacy by designing it into the big data pipeline from the outset. Adapting data protection frameworks to increasingly pervasive and precise location data is difficult largely because data privacy has not served as a fundamental design element from the outset. More effective protection of location data will have to be designed up front into technologies, algorithms, and processes. Technological advances, including the arrival of system-on-a-chip sensors, can aid by allowing on-the-fly data encryption. Other advances could include protocols allowing citizens to control and allocate rights regarding their data. Failing to ensure strong privacy protection may result in a regulatory backlash against the collection and processing of location data. And this, this would hamper innovation, reduce consumer welfare, and curb the economic benefits that the use of such data delivers. New models of public-private partnership involving data sharing may be necessary to leverage both public and private benefits. On the one hand, an increasing amount of the actionable data pertaining to road safety, traffic management, and travel behavior is held by the private sector. On the other hand, public authorities are still and will likely continue to be mandated to provide essential services that the public prefers private actors not to provide. Should data accessed by public authorities continue to be modeled strictly on a supplier-client relationship, or can new, more creative partnerships be developed that enable both the private sector to innovate and the public sector to carry out its mandates? Innovative data sharing partnerships will likely develop, though these should not obviate the need for market power tests, benefit cost assessment, and public utility objectives. Transport authorities will need to audit the data they use in order to understand what it says and does not say, and how it can best be used. Transport authorities will need to ensure an adequate level of data literacy for handling new streams of data and novel data types. Ensuring robust, persistent, and harmonized provenance metadata will facilitate data usability audits. Big data is often not clean. Issues with data quality may entail significant upfront costs to render it usable, and this should be considered early on in the decision-making processes.